Hey there, my name is Felix, and today I'm going to be talking about Hai ibn Yaqsan, the allegorical tale by the 12th century Islamic philosopher Ibn Tufail. Please excuse any mispronunciation as much as there might be. I'll also be mentioning two other extremely important thinkers, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd. Ibn Tufail was born near Granada in 1105, and though he is best known for Hai ibn Yaqsan, he also made a number of contributions to astronomy and medicine. Al-Ghazali was a Persian polymath who, at the end of the 11th century, left his successful teaching career in Baghdad and became a Sufi ascetic in order to seek a more simple and direct understanding of God. Ibn Rushd was Andalusian and lived about a century after Al-Ghazali. He was a staunch Aristotelian and sought to reconcile Islamic theology with Aristotle's metaphysics. Now, as I mentioned before, the main text I'll be discussing today is Hai ibn Yaqsan by Ibn Tufail. This text was not only highly influential in the Islamic philosophical tradition, but was also drawn from by many of the major thinkers of the Enlightenment. The book has some interesting things to say about the Islamic concept of fitra, and the relationship between abstract philosophical study of God and mystical practice. I'll also be talking about Al-Ghazali's path to Sufism, his deliverance from error. This is the work by Al-Ghazali which is most relevant to our discussion today, and it's also a great short read. Another more peripherally relevant text by Al-Ghazali is his Tahafut al falasifa or The Incoherence of the Philosophers, in which he charges Aristotelian Islamic philosophers, notably Ibn Sina, with unbelief, for what he sees as their rejection of core Islamic beliefs in favor of ancient Greek metaphysics. Almost a hundred years later, Ibn Rushd wrote a book in response to Ghazali's Tahafut al falasifa He called this book Tahafut al-Tahafut, or The Incoherence of the Incoherence. This work, while not as well received in the Islamic world as Al-Ghazali's, had a significant impact on 13th century Christian scholasticism. In fact, the tension between Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd was in many ways mirrored in the Western Christian world as Aristotelianism and scholasticism grew in influence. Hopefully, I'm clear enough throughout the video that even if you don't have prior knowledge of these thinkers, you can still understand how their philosophies contrast with Ibn Tufail's. In High Ibn Yaqsan, the titular protagonist is raised by a doe on a deserted island. After her death, he begins a spiritual journey, and arrives at the conclusion that an omnipotent creator must exist. He engages in introspective prayer, and through mystical practice, comes to know God intimately. Eventually, he is visited by a man named Absal, who after some spiritual disagreements with his friend Solomon, and dissatisfaction with the ritualistic religion of his people, left his island, where a prophetically revealed religion was practiced. Absal teaches high language, and the two compare their ideas about God. They find that Absal's revealed religion and High's natural religion correspond exactly. High accepts the prophet of Absal's religion as a legitimate messenger of God, and concludes that there are two paths to ultimate truth, revelation and natural discovery. At High's urging, the pair returns to Absal's island to teach the people there about their inward religion, which is less concerned with the symbolism and outward practice of revealed religion. However, the people of the island reject the pair's idea, preferring the ritualism and symbolism of the religion of their ancestors. High concludes that most people are incapable of understanding this inward, natural dimension of religion, and that the symbolistic method of teaching employed by the prophet is the only one that resonates with these people. High now understood the human condition. He saw that most men are no better than unreasoning animals, and realized that all wisdom and guidance, all that could possibly help them was contained already in the words of the prophets and the religious traditions. None of this could be different. There was nothing to be added. There is a man for every task, and every one belongs to the life for which he was created. So High went to Solomon and his friends and apologized, disassociated himself from what he had said. He told them that he had seen the light and realized that they were right. He urged them to hold fast to their observance of all the statutes regulating outward behavior and not delve into things that did not concern them, submissively to accept all the most problematic elements of the tradition and shun originality and innovation, follow in the footsteps of their righteous forebears, and leave behind everything modern. 
Hai and Absal retreat to Hai's island, where they served God on the island until man's certain fate overtook them. Since Hai was raised by a doe, he lives a life devoid of language, society, and most importantly, revealed religion. Over the course of his life, Hai uses both rational scientific inquiry and mystical practice in order to gain knowledge of God and devote himself to him. Eventually, through this text, the author Ibn Tufail reveals to us a philosophy which holds the intimate relationship between a human and their creator to be the end goal of all religion, natural and revealed, and unifies scientific or philosophical and mystical practice in the pursuit of this goal. Ibn Tufail's philosophy also raises some interesting questions about the context and purpose of revealed religion, and by unifying the scientific and mystical realms of discovery, he also succeeds in carving a position that is similar to, but still distinct from those of Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd. The key moment in Hai's journey towards knowledge of God is that of the death of his doe mother. Initially seeking a way to heal her, he decides to dissect her, in the hopes that if he could quote, find that organ which had been hurt, and remove whatever had lodged in it, it would revert to normal, its benefits would once more flow to the rest of the body, and all the bodily functions would resume. After finding her heart, and noticing that while one of its chambers is filled with blood, the other is empty, Hai deduces that whatever was once in that chamber must be the essential element of life. Further than this, he also comes to the conclusion that whatever was in that chamber is not only the central sustainer of a life, it is that life. By performing a scientific study of his doe mother's physical body, Hai comes to believe that the body is only a house for the soul, which is the real presence of a life. By analyzing the material world, he comes to believe in a transcendental one. Having philosophically moved beyond the material world, Hai buries his doe mother. By burying the doe rather than letting her body remain in the open as it naturally would, Hai asserts the primacy of the immaterial soul over the material body burying the corpse underground out of respect to the unique soul which inhabited it, rather than letting her body return to the ecosystem, and her life become a brief, specific allocation of nutrients and chemicals in an impersonal, purely material world. This passage from the material to the spiritual is microcosmic of Ibn Tufail's philosophy as a whole, which unifies the scientific and mystical by making the mystical and transcendent a necessary extension of the scientific and material. The idea that when one seeks understanding of the material world, they are necessarily led to seeking philosophical answers about non-material things is common throughout theism, and I believe is specifically emblematic of the rationalist tradition of Falsafa, which Ibn Tufail is working within. Once Hai eventually becomes convinced of the existence of a creator, he begins to seek the direct knowledge of this creator. In contrast with both Sufi philosophies, such as Al-Ghazali's, which emphasized direct experience as the primary, if not sole, source of knowledge of God, and rationalist philosophies, such as Ibn Rushd's, which tend to focus instead on the knowledge of God as a philosophical concept, Ibn Tufail's philosophy sees all these methods as integral to a deep knowledge of God. One could argue that since direct experience emerges from abstract philosophical contemplation, which emerges from consideration of the material world, that Ibn Tufail believes direct experience and revelation to be superior to other forms of knowledge. However, the fact that Hai's decision to pursue God through mystical experience was so dependent on God leading him to belief in a creator through scientific inquiry, there are a number of verses in the Quran which emphasize the role of the material world in glorifying God. For example, verse 64.1 says that, whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on earth is exalting Allah. To him belongs dominion, and to him belongs praise, and he is over all things competent. Theological principles like these, which affirm the natural world as displaying the image of God and serving to glorify him, lend themselves quite well to a philosophy which sees the study of the material world as leading to belief in God and yearning for the direct knowledge of him. This viewpoint is heavily dependent on the principle that humans are naturally capable of and tend towards a correct godly interpretation of the universe. Or in other words, that God gives every person the tools needed to find a correct and godly interpretation of the world. This principle finds its place in Islam as fitra, 
the natural innocence and monotheism which infants are said to exist in. While Hai does go through a period of irreligiousness before the death of his Doe mother, he never embraces idolatry or becomes explicitly non-monotheist. Through only rational deduction and observation of the world around him, Hai is able to come to know God. While Ibn Tufail seems to have a generally positive view of personal knowledge seeking in its various forms, this does not mean that he does not have prejudices when it comes to a person's interaction with religion. Instead of contrasting philosophical and scientific contemplation with the search for revealed truth through mystical practice, Ibn Tufail separates the deeply personal quest for the experience of God with the practice of public religion as revealed by prophets. In other words, Ibn Tufail is less concerned with emphasizing a specific method of knowledge seeking than he is with emphasizing the superiority of personal knowledge seeking rather than blind submission to the formalities of ritualistic public religion. This viewpoint is summarized in High's eventual decision to give up on enlightening the people of Solomon's Island, realizing that most men are no better than unreasoning animals. High still believes that those who practice their religion faithfully and follow the rules meant to make them righteous will be saved, and that the religions they practice are true expressions of a belief system given to the people by God. But they will merely sit on the right, whereas those who run in the forefront, those who run in the forefront, they will be brought near. In clearer terms, following religion as your society tells you to is sufficient to avoid hell. But in order to be close to God, one must exceed these expectations and pursue a close relationship with God, fostered through scientific, philosophical, and mystical inquiry. The idea that scripture and religion are meant to be understood in different ways by people of varying intellectual capability is shared by Ibn Rushd, who believed that while most people must understand scripture and religion literally, because they lack the intellectual capacity or stable philosophical grounding to understand allegorical interpretation, the Quran invites those who do have this capability to understand it in a deeper, fuller, and largely allegorical way. In the decisive treaty, Ibn Rushd states that the reason we have received a scripture, with both an apparent and an inner meaning, lies in the diversity of people's natural capacities and the difference of their innate dispositions with regard to assent. The reason why we have received in scripture texts whose apparent meanings contradict each other is in order to draw the attention of those who are well grounded in science to the interpretation that reconciles them. Both Ibn Rushd and Ibn Tufail seem to believe that God has called a certain elite intellectual class to understand him at a deeper level than others. Ibn Rushd concludes that since the masses were incapable of understanding scriptures allegorically, attempts by them to do so would make them fall into unbelief. Additionally, attempting to reveal the inner meaning of religion to them was tantamount to guiding them to unbelief. This is the same reasoning that Hai used when deciding to leave the island. Though Ibn Tufail is very explicit about his holding this position, I wonder how compatible it even is with his own story. If most people are simply incapable of understanding or engaging in high spiritual method and need to be given this symbolistic religion by prophets, then is the story dependent on high having been lucky enough to have been born smart enough to engage in these methods? Perhaps God only puts those who are capable of understanding a more mystical approach to religion in a situation where they will come across it. However, if Hai was one of the unreasoning animals that he deemed Solomon's people to be, would he have failed to find God and lived his life on the island as a non-monotheist? This seems unlikely, so perhaps it is only through social conditioning that the masses have become unreceptive to direct knowledge of God. However, this doesn't seem to be the case, since Ibn Tufail stresses the necessity of public revealed religion, and also makes sure to stress that this revealed religion is still a genuine expression of God's true nature and true belief in God. This inconsistency raises further questions, however, about the relevance of Fitra to Ibn Tufail's thought. The Quran is clear about the truth of Fitra and how even synonymous it is with the eventual monotheism and direct experience of God that we achieve after mystical practice. The Quran tells people to, quote, 
direct your face towards the religion, inclining to truth. Adhere to the fitrah of Allah, upon which he has created all people. No change should there be in the creation of Allah. That is the correct religion, but most of the people do not know. If Ibn Tufayl believes in fitrah, then it doesn't seem to make that much sense that the vast majority of people are incapable of having a deep personal relationship with God in which they are guided by him, seeing as all infants are born in this state to some degree. However, I do think that Ibn Tufayl can reconcile these positions, and that it probably has something to do with um, God giving everybody the tools suited for them and the tools necessary for them to reach him. Uh, the tools necessary for high to achieve knowledge of God would be different from that of a person living in a society with a revealed religion. Additionally, in regards to this work's legacy, subsequent philosophers have tended to focus on the philosophy expressed in the earlier half of the book, that is, the capacity of humans to reach true knowledge through analysis of the world around them. They haven't factored in so much these beliefs in differing interpretations based on differing intellectual capabilities that Ibn Tufayl seems to express in the second half of the book. Now, moving on to some thoughts about Al-Ghazali and how his thought relates to these problems. Al-Ghazali does seem to recognize this initial state of innocence, fitra, as being synonymous with mystical experience of God as attained through spiritual practice. He states that I also heard the tradition related from the Apostle of God, God's blessing and peace be upon him, in which he said, Every infant is born endowed with the fitra, then his parents make him a Jew or a Christian or a Magian. Consequently, I felt an inner urge to seek the true meaning of the original fitra, and the true meaning of the beliefs arising through slavish aping of parents and teachers. Al-Ghazali doesn't really seem to hold the same view as Ibn Tufayl on the importance of differing interpretation between classes, let alone the possibility of differing rewards for these interpretations. Looking at his personal journey as recounted in his Path to Sufism, his deliverance from error, we can see that he initially lived a life primarily concerned with the understanding and teaching of God and Islam as a philosophical concept. Eventually, he realized that all the theory and practice in which he was engrossed in was eye service and fakery. With this realization, he resolved to begin a life instead focused on the direct experience of God as attained through Sufi practice. Al-Ghazali puts emphasis on Sufi practice representing the union of theory and practice, and High's mystical practice is similar in that he unifies his philosophical and rational belief in God with mystical practice that provides him with direct experience of God. However, while Ibn Tufayl views this practice as inherently different from the religion practiced by the masses and unachievable for most people, Al-Ghazali does not seem to explicitly hold this view. One of the chapters in his Deliverance from Error and Path to Sufism is titled The True Nature of Prophecy and the Need All Men Have for It, in which he argues for a higher form of knowledge than simple rational insight into the world around us, and comes to the conclusion that this knowledge can only be reached through the path of the Sufis. Of course, this raises some issues for a portrayal of Al-Ghazali's theology as egalitarian in its offerings of unity with God, as Sufism is a practice which requires one to isolate themselves from society to some extent in order to pursue it to its highest level. However, the Sufi path which Al-Ghazali advocates is not a fundamentally different mode of spirituality to commonly practiced Islam in the way that High's introspective religion is. While the common practitioner of Islam may not be able to achieve it as well as a dedicated Sufi mystic, there is no intrinsic lack of capability which renders most people incapable of working towards the goal of, quote, lopping off the obstacle present in the soul and ridding oneself of reprehensible habits and vicious qualities in order to attain thereby a heart empty of all save God and adorned with the constant remembrance of God. While Ibn Tufayl's idea of mystical and introspective religion or as Al-Ghazali might call it, fruitional experience, is an entirely separate mode of engaging with God. Al-Ghazali advocates a single religious method which can be pursued at various degrees. So yeah, 
That's going to do it for my discussion of uh, Ibn Tufail's High Ibn Yaksan, as well as Al Ghazali and Ibn Rushd. Uh, I have some more stuff written up specifically about Al Ghazali and his beliefs about the interpretation of the Quran and how the Quran sort of reveals itself to those who analyze it in Al Ghazali's view. So, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. This is my first video on the channel, and I'm excited to get going with it. So yeah, God bless, and have a great day.